Well, I, man, I, like I said, I'm so excited. I've done so much research. Shane Sparks, big fan of yours, man. I'm ready to get into it if you are, brother. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I'm a big fan of yours as well. You do a great job with this podcast. So this is uh, really cool to be on. Well, it's awesome to have you. I want to start with, there's a story you've told on a couple of shows. Your, you and your mom went to a baseball game when you were 11. And you had this like epiphany moment of what you wanted to do in your life. And I just thought it was so cool how your mom didn't squash the idea when a lot of parents could have. Could you just share that story to kick things off? Yeah, it's a story I love to tell because it was it was one of those life changing moments. And it literally was just a matter of moments. But and I got to look this up, Ryan, because uh, there's a baseball reference dot com, I think, is the website where you can go back and I could find the exact game. Because I, I remember Darrell Evans hit a home run. Brewers won 14-2. It was a Wednesday afternoon. I'm going to find it. I'm going to find it. <laughs> but anyways, I go to this Brewer game, and I'm a huge baseball fan. Wrestling, I've always said, is the best sport. Baseball's the best game. Baseball's my first love. A uh, combination of the, the game itself and then, of course, broadcasting. But we went to this game, and I got out of the car, and I, I can't even describe what it was like for me as a young kid to go to then County Stadium is where the Brewers played. And I'm a Braves fan, but, but I would go watch the Brewers. And it was like when I was at these games, third inning, I was already getting disappointed knowing that it was already the third inning. Like I didn't want it to be the third inning. And I wanted to be there all day. <laughs> it was truly my happy place, still is. But I get out of the car and it was a great Wednesday afternoon, the smell of tailgating in the parking lot. I mean, it was a great scene, but I remember getting out of the car and getting locked in on that stadium. And I remember looking at the stadium and thinking in my mind, like, this is what I want to do someday. This is what my passion is. And like you said, I was 11 years old and my mom looked at me and she goes, you know, what, what are you doing? And I remember I was pretty, I'm still a pretty emotional guy. And I remember being a little choked up, a little teary eyed. And I just said, this is, this is what I want to do someday. And I'll never forget her looking at me and just saying, yeah, that's what you're going to do. And that was it. I mean, it was, that was it. My parents were always extremely supportive and uh, it was a big moment because you're right. A lot of parents might've been like, including myself, if I'm being honest, you know, maybe if one of my kids would say something like that, I might be like, oh, you know, you don't, yeah. want to, you don't want to set yourself up for that kind of disappointment, perhaps. But uh, I'll always love my mom for that. It's uh, one of those stories where I'm, you know, I could be an old man, 90 years old, rocking on the rocking chair in the front <laughs> porch. And I will always, always remember that. I'm going to remember that story for a long time because it's so touching and moving. And yeah, it's like you, you get older and you realize that your parents did the best they could. You know, they have some flaws, but you realize what they did really well. And like you, man, my parents were just believers. They supported us no matter what. Whereas you meet some people who don't have that. And it's like, man, how hard is that for a kid where you have someone who's negative around you all the time? So it's, it's cool. You did not have that experience. Yeah. And, and you're right now getting older myself. I mean, you, you figure out that that's not what everybody gets. Right. And I've, I've just become, I mean, I just think it's wisdom with age, but that story I've definitely gained more appreciation for the older I've gotten because there's no doubt about it. That stuff matters and it matters a ton. And, and I, I realize that and I'm, I'm thankful for it. So were you a kid who just had like a crazy imagination growing up? Like you were always envisioning yourself as like a broadcaster and like, how did that kind of go from that moment forward? Yeah, I just, I always love broadcasting and I love baseball and I love wrestling. I, I never really pictured myself until I got a little bit older broadcasting wrestling because wrestling wasn't on TV. It wasn't like, you, you, I mean, my first moment I remember where I thought, man, this wrestling quote unquote broadcasting could be kind of cool is 1994. I was a senior in high school and my dad took me to the division three national tournaments at Stevens point. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I ever heard Ed Alverde on a microphone. <laughs> and that was another one of those sitting in the stands, like, wow, like this is really cool. That was a story. And then I would back up. That was one of them. That would, that would have been number two. My first one actually would have been earlier on 1992 big 10 championships. And I've told this story before too, but I love telling it 1992 
Big 10 championships in Madison. Those Hawkeye teams were loaded. <laughs> and what I loved about that, and I love this uh, in any sporting event, but especially wrestling, but specifically the Big 10 championships, because they don't do this anymore. And I wish they would. They did face-offs. Mm. And it was awesome. I believe it was Terry Shockley who was, was doing it for, for Madison at the time. I believe it was Terry. Phenomenal job, you know, given a guy's record, you know, ranked number one in the country from Iowa, Terry Brand. You know, Brands walks out there. I think it might have been Dan Flood for Wisconsin. 134, if I remember right, was Tom Brands and Joey Gilbert of Michigan. Mm. Zappadal and Hanuki at 118. I mean, I remember sitting in the stands. I was so fired up. That day also, you talk about days that change your life or change your path. That March day in 1992 did that for me, for sure. I love that era of wrestling. Uh, I don't know if that was the year like Tom Ryan wrestled Matt Demeray, but you know, Pat Smith was in there as well at that weight. So those that, that era was just so fun because Gable had that comeback and the brands, the Steiners, Ryland, Randleman. It's just tons of names. I, I love that. I love that time frame. And so it you was were, great. You were what, like a sophomore in high school then? Sophomore in high school, yes. So you, I, I also love this story about how you're, uh, you know, in eighth grade, you were like 70 pounds, which I can relate to that. My brother was uh, 70 pounds in eighth grade. Um, and so by the time you were a junior in high school, you took third in the state. And then your senior year, you made the decision to cut down to 103 again. And you had this thought and it just registered with me because I used to have this as well. And I look back thinking it's silly that you were hating weight cutting so much that you were excited for the season to be over. And uh, just kind of think back now on, on why you went 103, because I heard you beat the guys who are at 112. So what kind of went into that thought process for that year? Yeah, it's real simple. And it's, it's something, again, that here we are almost 30 years later that this story, the other ones I love to tell, and this one I'm, I'm glad to tell it, but it ticks me off. I'm still yeah. ticked off about it because the reason I did it, Ryan, I was looking for the easier path. Mm. I wanted the easier path. And if in my entire life, and in the big scheme of life, was it a horrible decision? No, it wasn't a horrible decision. But, and this tells you my life is pretty pretty good. <laughs> it, it's a regret. It yeah. might be, it's one of my top regrets. And yeah, I mean, we're talking two weeks, three weeks into the season, I had a calendar, you know, back in those days, we had phones on the wall and I can remember where, where it was in my parents' house and going down and counting the days, you know, 60 days to go, 50 days to go, being miserable, not getting any better, not enjoying it. But the, the biggest disappointment there is why did you do it? You wanted the easier path. And that to me, when I look back on my life, that was a red flag. You know, that was something, it was, it was a red flag and uh, obviously health wise, it wasn't good for me. And uh, that is one, it all worked out for me. It all goes the way it's supposed to, but that's one I would love if I could go back and talk to myself heading into that season, I can promise you that decision would not be the same if I got to have another crack at it. But yeah, that's, that's something Ryan, you know, being around, you know, high level wrestlers and before I got into wrestling. I did a sports talk show in Wisconsin and, and did a lot of stuff with the Brewers and Packers, Bucks. I mean, you're seeing these high-level athletes, but especially in wrestling, because it's fascinating to me. Like, why are the great ones great? There's a lot of common denominators from a skill set standpoint, but what really makes the great ones great? And to me, the great ones, they don't want the easy path. No. They want their best against somebody else's best best because their self-belief in them they got self-belief and their preparation they want it they want to be the man and i wish i would have had that it's such a good point because i love how the lesson is not don't co wait the lesson is wish it were harder and man it's like yeah we can all remember situations where maybe you had a big match and i distinctly remember everyone who listens to the show knows joe williams was my hero growing up i love oh, joe man. williams <laughs> but I used to envision if I had like a tough match, I'm like, God, I, I wish Joe Williams could just go wrestle this match for me. <laughs> and now I'm like, what kind of a loser thinks that? Like, you think Aaron Pico was thinking that in high school? No. So, and not that I didn't have good role models. It's just, I wasn't m mature enough. So it's, I just thought it was cool that you kind of had that same reflection. You have to share the story though, that year, 
You're making the cut to 103. You had a Barry Davis like moment with wheat thins and diet coke. When did that happen? <laughs> that would have been February of 1994. It was the and this again, just disaster. The way that I did this, <laughs> just disaster. I was, you know, all wrestlers. I think a lot of us. I've always talked about the letter P. And, and I got to trademark this and market this better. And I, I got these written down somewhere. But when you look at wrestling, it's like, you know, preparation, position, poise, uh, perseverance. I mean, you can go on and on and on. And one of them that I've added recently is paranoia. You got to be a little paranoid. You got to be a little paranoid. You're up five, nothing. You better be a little paranoid. And, and, and I would say this, it's like a recipe. The paranoia when the recipe asks for a teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon of salt is good. A cup of salt, not so good. <laughs> so that's the paranoia. You don't need two cups of paranoia. You know, that's where you better have two cups of, of uh, physicality or, or position. Mm -hmm. But you better have a, a, a dash of that paranoia. So I'm, I'm paranoid. And I used to, again, Weight would weight. I did a pretty good job of, but I'm fighting mother nature. I'm cutting down to, I think I had to make one Oh six. Mm. And I had a radio station job on Sundays, senior in high school. Great, great little job. So I'm at this radio station by myself and it's, it's literally, I got like five more days and, and I got my last way in and I'm going to, I'm going to be fine. And I done all right all year. And that day I remember going up, I'm there all by myself. I go up in the, the break room and there's like a box of wheat thins and it's unopened. And it's like, first of all, if I'd ask myself, you know, talk to myself now, I'd be like, they weren't yours. What are you opening up the box of wheat thins? They weren't even <laughs> yours. You should have been touching them anyways, but whatever. So I, I open up the box of wheat thins and it's going to be just, we're just going to have one of them. You know, I'm going to have one. <laughs> Long story short, box of wheat thins is gone. Couple sodas. I go to the Ramada Inn in Fond du Lac that night. It's like, I don't know what time I got there, probably eight at night. And I can remember getting on the scale. I was 10 over. And I remember looking myself in the mirror and I just looked myself in the mirror. I said, what did, what did you do? What did you do? So where I really went wrong is because I'm paranoid, I cut 10 pounds in the next 24 hours. Fighting <laughs> for four days later? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, who does this stuff? Like looking back at it now, it's like, what were you doing? Like, that was bad, but I, I, I probably wouldn't have cut 10 pounds that night, but I was paranoid. So then I, you know, then I obviously made weight, but looking back on it now, it's like, oh. yeah, you didn't necessarily do things to put yourself in position to win, you know? So it's all things you learn, but man. Those weight cutting days in high school where you would try to make weight on Monday and just starve it off so you didn't have to work out and just remembering how miserably like just no energy you've had. And like, you tried to go through these workouts and I mean, now, now being around some, you know, some guys making weight at the highest levels, I'm like, Oh, that's how you do the weight. They're not down sure. to weight except for like 20 minutes. You know, I was down on Monday, holding it off and eating like <laughs> I would weigh out my cookies. Cause I, I would only eat a half pound and I get a half pound of cookies or a half pound of vegetables. So I mean, it's just funny the things that people do to make weight back in the day. Um, so that was your senior year. You got it back off. You're on weight on like Tuesday morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tuesday afternoon. Tuesday, actually, Tuesday afternoon. Like, Tuesday actually would have been like Tuesday after wrestling. We had a, a, a Tuesday wrestling practice. Then I went back and did another 15 on the bike, probably ran a couple of miles, push ups, sit ups, whatever. And I was on. And I thought at that time, like, oh, I'm good. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you. You uh, make it all the way to the finals. You're winning the finals. You end up losing in overtime. I heard there were some questionable stalling calls. I'm just asking you because you're such a positive silver lining guy. How did you process that loss? Did that one eat at you for a while? I got to tell you this, Ryan. It was high school. Again, these are things you just learned. It was high school. Yeah. Like it wasn't that big of a deal. Looking back on it, I can't tell you how devastating that was for me. Like again, Looking back on this decades later, that loss just like paralyzed me. It paralyzed me. It should have never, ever been that big of a deal. And it wasn't, my parents didn't make it a big deal. 
Nobody made it a big deal except I did. And I think it was so much, I know exactly what it was. And it's kind of funny. I think I just got this right now during this conversation with you because I haven't sat and analyzed this for a long time. So many cliches that we hear about all the time. Gosh, there's some that are really true. And one of them is enjoy the process. Well, I told you about the process. It was horrible. The process <laughs> was horrible for me. I'm not getting any better. I'm not enjoying it. Like the process was brutal. So with the process being brutal, I only had one thing to hang my hat on. And what was it? The result. It was 100% about the result. 100%. And I, I lost, I, I just didn't, I, I lost what the, I just lost the sport. I lost myself. And again, it's not a big deal. It's high school. But what makes wrestling so awesome is if I wasn't doing this podcast with you and if I didn't do sports broadcasting for wrestling, nobody ever knows this story. Nobody cares about the story. I get it. Mm -hmm. But it's so personal. This yeah. sport is so personal. It's individual. I mean, we can all tell stories about you know, situations all alone. In a lot of ways, it's, it's one thing that I appreciate about doing the wrestling broadcasting is it, I get so many of those same feelings, but I love this. Mm -hmm. I love it. Uh, but, but people don't see me at, you know, three in the morning doing prep work. I mean, it's not all glorious. And that's kind of like the early morning weigh-ins. I mean, that's, and that's kind of how I process it in my mind. Mm -hmm. Like, Everybody loves to be on TV. Yeah. And everybody loves to be in big wrestling matches. Yeah. That's, that's great. But you don't just wake up and roll out of bed and get there. It's a, it's work. But uh, yeah, that, that loss, unfortunately, that got, way, that, that was way, way, way too big of a, uh, I just should have never gotten to that point. I mean, it took years, years to get past that. I mean, I can't imagine. And again, that was a little high school wrestling match. I can't imagine what some of these, you know, high level guys, but, but that's the key. And I know it's easier said than done, but you got to try to, you got to try to get past it because it will, it will hurt you. And it's like looking back on that now, knowing we, knowing what we do about being loose and enjoying it. Like you were the opposite of that. And like a lot of us were back in those days. No, you were tight. You were gritting your teeth. And I'm not saying you specifically, but it didn't seem like a, uh, you know, like I was hanging out with the Cornell guys the week before the trials doing some filming. They're like the Penn State guys. They're joking around. They're like the loosest people I've ever seen. And they wrestle like that. And it's just so crazy now to see like how much more we know about competing than we did back when you were wrestling in the early 90s, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A lot, lot has changed, which is good. So how long after that until you found out you were having a, a son? So that would have been, uh, you know, February of 94. and. Uh, Austin was born, man, he'll be 25 here on uh, a month. So, I mean, it would have been like a year later. Yeah. Wow. Like, like a year and a half, year and a half, would, you know, when I would have found out, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that was an interesting time also. Well, the reason I ask is it sounds like that was, to me, you've had a number of turning points and we're going to hit on a big one coming up when you made the decision to move to Arizona. But, um, you know, you seem like a guy with big dreams and, you know, before you had your son at such a young age, and obviously that changed your plans, what did you want to do when you were leaving high school? I wanted, my, my dream was to walk on at Arizona State. I wanted to go to Walter Cronkite, and I wanted to wrestle at Arizona State. So, I mean, that's, that was the plan, but I mean, but it was the, I shouldn't, you know what? That was the dream. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the plan. And, and again, looking back on it, that, that's where there was a disconnect. Like you had a dream, that's all fine and dandy, but what's the plan to get there? So, so that was it. I mean, I never had a, I never had a plan B. It was, we're going to be a broadcaster. It would have been great to wrestle at ASU looking back on it. I would have most likely never been good enough, but I probably would have been able to grind it out. I, who knows what happened? Maybe I would have made a great, you know, maybe I would have made a great manager. Who knows? I'm, I'm, I'm sure had I gotten to that point, I would have, would have been affiliated with the program in some way just because I, I just love being a part of it. What was the worst job you had in your 20s before you moved to Arizona to become a broadcaster? Easiest, that's an easy question. I, I had a couple. So I, I find out that Austin, you know, find out we're pregnant and I'm 19, almost 20, I believe, if I remember right. But <laughs> um, wow, I went to work on a forklift and I sucked at it. I mean, I got these big, like, 
these humongous pallets of, of you know, target flyers. They're slippery. I dumped the pallets over. I mean, I was horrible at my job. I was horrible at it. <laughs> and I hated it. So I did that for a little while. And then the worst job I ever had for sure is I went to work at a powder metal factory. And I would go, it was, I would come home covered in like this soot basically. And I went back to that powder metal factory last August for the first time. Wow. And I, I was there with my kids. They were in the car. I said, we got a, you know, just kind of a teaching moment. I'm going to tell you what, why this building right here means something to me. And I got out and, you know, took a picture of that building with my, you know, by that building, a selfie with it. And I look at it from time to time, just again, to just kind of just be thankful for, for what's happened to me. But at the same time, I wouldn't recommend that. That was some tough, oh. that, was, that job was horrible. That was horrible. And I remember once my mom told me the story, my dad passed away a few years ago and, and I've never talked to him about this. I wish I, I would have, it just never came up. But my mom said there was a time when I came home and my dad must have came over and like saw me and he like made the comments to my mom like, man, I, I just didn't think this is how it would go for this guy. You, you know, it just kind of, but, and I talk about this Ryan all the time and I, I embrace it, I own it. Everything works out for, it, 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 everything happens for a reason. But at the same time, I'm not afraid to talk about making good decisions. Make good decisions. Life is about decisions. And unfortunately, and I, I wouldn't trade Austin for anything, but when you make certain decisions, they have consequences and you don't get to pick them. Are they fair? I don't know if they're fair. Who cares? Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But there's, there are certain points in your life where you got to make critical decisions and you better get them right. And there were a few, I've made, I've, I've made a lot of really good decisions, but I've made a couple that have uh, taken me off track a little bit. For sure. I mean- <laughs> The thing about those jobs is you get to work with people who are like 40 and they've been doing that for 20 years. And you yeah. really think you're like, oh my God, what happens if I'm that? And there's nothing wrong with that if you like it, but a lot of people sure. do, you know, that's like the most where you really get up close. You're like 20. Some of your friends are still in school and you're working with some dude who's 45 and he's been in that plan his whole <laughs> life. Yeah, that's it. And it's, 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 I, I, I like I said, I went back to that place last August and I, I go past quad graphics where I drove the forklift all the time. It's right on 41. I mean, I drive past it all the time. And uh, I like letting my mind go back there a little bit because it just reminds me of, you know, how fortunate I am, but at the same time, being grateful for challenges, you know, those, I, that was all part of the, you know, that's all part of the book. And we're not going to go chronological the whole time, but so far we are. And I'm just going to keep with that. So you're at this horrible job. You get into car sales, which anyone who knows you and knows your personality, it's pretty obvious you'd be a great salesman. Um, and you're having some, having some success. You got some money in your pocket. You're driving home one day. And what happened next? So it's a, and I, I can't remember a lot of stuff from three weeks ago, but for whatever reason, <laughs> I can remember some of these things. It was a Thursday. And Thursday, the reason I know it was a Thursday is because it was a we work later. So that day, and I was I was doing pretty well. I mean, I was 26 or no, 25 years old. I was 25 years old, had a house, you know, drove a BMW. I mean, I thought I was hot stuff. I mean, I was doing all right. And in that car dealership, I started in uh, December, but I hit the sales floor in January of 2001. I was the only guy and I went through, I did it for five months. I did it for six months. But when you walked into that dealership, I was the only name on the plaque. Salesman of the month, January, February, March, April, May, only guy in the plaque. Okay. Wow. So I was, I was doing all right in my, the guy that owned the dealership and I got to find him. I got to go out and find him soon. His name was John Colasso and John took a liking to me and he was tough. So some of the biggest influences in my life were, I mean, not some of the biggest influences in my life were hard on me. And I love, I like being coached mm -hmm. and John coached me. He'd bring me to his office and like, we would like do sales training back and forth. Guy says this, this rejection, what are you coming back with? Kind of like wrestling. 
shot, counter shot, drip. <laughs> That's what it was. Can, can always take everything back to wrestling. Yeah. But uh, so I was doing really well, but I, I didn't love it. I just, I'm just competitive. And if there's a name on the plaque to be had, I want to, I want my name to be on the plaque. <laughs> so it was a Thursday. I, I think I'd sold three cars that day. So I probably had a pretty good day financially. And I went out to my car, got the, got the, I, I call it the, the rear view mirror. If I ever like had a book or a movie, that's what would be in it. And I looked in the mirror and I just looked at myself. I said, Shane, you sold three cars today. You made $4,000 and you hate this. That was it. Next day, got enrolled at a radio school in Arizona. I mean, it was that quick. I mean, How are you able to, to take these leaps of faith? Because you've done it several times when you left the radio show to start the Badger Wrestling website. And there's, there's a couple of moments of leaps of faith. I, I, and you make it, you know, some people might sit on that decision for 20 years before they decide to do anything. So how are you able to make those decisions so quickly? A big part of it's support. My parents, I mentioned I had a house. So how did I, what happened? My parents took over the payments and they, they ended up renting it out. But I'll be honest, if my, one of my kids came to me with that, it's like, I don't have, I'm not going to do that. And, and, and my parents didn't come from much either. Mm -hmm. I mean, luckily it was able to rent out, you know, so that was able to pay the, the payment and the taxes, but that's the biggest thing. I mean, no doubt about it. To be able to take some of these, these, these leaps, you have to have the backing to do it. So yeah, it's a good story. It sounds good. Uh, and there's maybe, you know, a little bit of craziness in my mind, but at this, but if I'm being honest, that's more of a credit to a lot of other people for sure. Yeah. It's cool that you, I mean, consistently done that though. So how long were you in Arizona at this quote unquote world renowned broadcast school? So this, this broadcast school was something, okay. <laughs> I mean, it was in a strip mall. I mean, it was, but, but here's what I knew. I knew that that life was about connections, networking. And I don't know how I knew that. That, that was something where I had a feel for that I stand by to this day. Mm -hmm. So I was there from July of 2001 to February of 2002. So it's like six, seven months, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was this little hole in the wall school. I, 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 it's been shut down forever. Uh, but there, there have been some, some successful people that have come out of there. But uh, I, I, I got there and that right when I got there, I mean, you talk about small world stories. The admissions guy, his name was Jeremy Nicolato. This is in Phoenix, Arizona. Jeremy's from West Dallas, Wisconsin. So when I like Google radio schools, that's the one that pops up and I call it. I never called two schools. I called one. Like, I mean, called one. He answers the phone. We click. It was just out in Boise, Idaho to see him, you know, a year ago. Wow. And when, when I drive out there, I walk in and he's like, do you want to do a PA at the raceway tonight? I'm like, sure. And I'm not much of a PA guy, but uh, I mean, I don't have that Jason Bryant, you know, booming yeah. voice. But uh, yeah, next thing you know, there I am at Phoenix Speedway or whatever, doing like drag racing PA work. And then That's I- First night? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I had not even been to school yet. I mean, I, I went, yeah, it was a, it was a Friday night that I was there. I might've been there the next day. And uh, so that was a huge contact. And then Jeremy, the same guy got me into, I believe it was called Metro source. It was a job. It was a, a job where I would like write sports stories and then get the audio from the stringers. And, th and this stuff's on the biggest radio stations in the country. I had no business getting that job, none. I remember going in and the guy that interviewed me and man, I'd love to find this guy. I don't remember his name, but I had no chance at this. Like I had no business. And I remember glancing down at his desk, desk and seeing a stack of applications. Yeah. And I'm like, I got nothing. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know how, any of this editing software. I have no experience. Like I have no chance at this. And he was a Mets fan and I'm a Braves fan. And he had some Mets stuff, Mets stuff up in his office. And I'm like, I got nothing to lose here. I, I'm going to make a smart aleck comment and he's either going to like it or he's not. Well, he liked it. 
<laughs> and he must have liked me. And Jeremy, of course, helped because he already had worked there too. So uh, that was a huge break. That was a huge break. Wow. And it's, it just goes back to something I've heard you say is a big part about life is how you make other people feel. Absolutely. And I love that statement. And it's such a good, good reminder. Cause like we've all been around people where you leave, you're like, God, that guy just makes you feel so confident or so, you know, so uh, excited about life. And so it seems like you got that at a young age. Did, I mean, did you kind of have that self-confidence that people telling you like, you're just a natural charisma? I mean, how did you, where did you learn that? Yeah. I, I just remember, I remember when I was 10, 11 years old, I was in seventh grade, I think. Maybe I was a little older. But I remember doing some like PAs and, you know, and play by play at this, this baseball tournament down the road from my house. Mm -hmm. And that's another one of those things. It's a little fourplex diamonds. It's in Ripon, Wisconsin, where I grew up. And I, I like to drive down there once every couple of years and I'll just sit there all by myself. I mean, it's, it's the most, it's like overwhelming to me because it's like, this is where it started. I mean, that's really where it started. Guy, people let me on some loud mouth kid, you know, doing baseball. But I remember my seventh grade reading teacher coming up to me once and being like, man, I, I, I could hear, hear somebody doing this. And I, I thought they were doing a great job. And I was like, wow, you're, she's like, you're really talented at this. That, that, was, that was one of the, I remember that, you know, I remember her telling me that. And uh, I, I always... You know, I think a lot of what's helped me also is, and I saw this with James Green. Mm. James Green had a tweet a while ago. I think it was James. And he said, when did you realize you were competitive? And that really made me think because I remember at a very early age being competitive, not mm -hmm. psycho competitive, but I was in Cub Scouts. So I'm in first grade. We're selling Christmas wreaths. I had to sell the most Christmas wreaths. And back in those days, I was, I was seven years old. I'm out there doing it myself. Yeah. I mean, this day and age, I never let my, you know, nine-year-old, <laughs> 10 year old daughter go out and sell anything. But in those days, I could hustle. I did a lot of hustling as a little kid. We had this thing called Badger Boy State that was by my house at this same park. Mm -hmm. And they were like incoming college kids. They played softball in the afternoons. I'd go down there and sell cans of soda for 50 cents a can, made some money. I, that, that baseball diamond, I would go down there and collect cans to make some money. It was like, there was always, I, I just love the feeling of winning. A lot of people talk about, oh man, I hate the feeling of losing. And maybe this is why I'm not in that top tier perhaps of competitive. I love to win. I didn't like, I, I, I don't like losing but I love to win. I'm not one of these guys where, man, the winning's okay, but I hate losing. Now that wasn't me. It's still not. I it's so love funny you say that. Win. I've never, I like you always read about those guys that say, Oh, I hated to lose. And I always like acted like I knew what they meant, but I really never got that. And I'm kind of with you on that. I don't, it, that's never been a, a factor. And so that wasn't for you either. And so you have like this hustling from an early age. Now, once you graduate the broadcasting school, you come back to Wisconsin, I assume. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And I was listening to you on the Bashamania show, and that was all, that was an awesome interview. They're doing a great job on that show. You slept in your car a hundred times after after grad. I mean, yeah, is probably. that real? Yeah, yeah. What I what I did was I go back to the, you know, I go back to some of these moments. So I get back from radio school, and I don't have the house anymore. I don't have the car anymore. I bought a five hundred dollar nineteen eighty eight Plymouth Grand Fury. I think was the car. <laughs> It'd be one of those things where if I had a bunch of money, I'd never, I'd still have that car. Yeah. I'd be like, what do you drive that car for? It's like, listen, that car means everything to me. So I, again, based on connections, when I'm dealing with these stringers at the radio job or, you know, while I'm going to radio school, I meet the people that did Milwaukee sports. So I meet the people in Milwaukee, Bill Johnson. I'm on, I'm on Facebook with Bill. He hires me six bucks an hour. This is 2000, February of 2002, $6 an hour in Milwaukee, which was, a, which was an hour and a half away from where I lived, okay? So I remember getting hired there and 
I was, I was going to get to do a Brewer game. And when I say a Brewer game, you basically sit in the press box and I'm going in. Maybe I'm doing some reports. I don't think I was at that point, but I'm getting some audio and then sending it back to the place where I used to work at in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I will never forget, I am driving there. I got the shirt and tie on. The car's got no air conditioning. I'm sweating. It's, it's, I'm making six bucks an hour. <laughs> and I, I flip the mirror and I look at myself. Probably shouldn't have been doing this when I was driving, but <laughs> I looked at myself in the mirror and I went back. I said, Shane, you're driving a $500 car with no air conditioning. You're sweating. You're making $6 an hour and you love this. It was a complete opposite from not even a year earlier, probably nine months earlier when I sat in that car dealership parking lot and gave myself the same, same little talk. But uh, yeah, so that job, I spent, I've spent plenty. I've slept in a car so many times. I mean, Seriously. I, I, I'd be curious to know how many times I've slept in the car. First, first wrestling match I ever, or, or the state tournament. This was probably 2003, 2004. I worked at, got a radio station job. I was in Milwaukee and I got up to Appleton, <clears throat> which worked out well. But uh, I went, I wanted to cover the, the wrestling state tournaments where I could give some reports back to the radio station on, you know, the kids in the area. And it was cold. I mean, it's February and it's cold. Yeah, and yeah. I remember I, I, I didn't want to ask the radio station to do much. Like, you know what I mean? It was like, I want to make this just, I don't want to give them any reason to say no. Like, oh, well, the hotel caught, like no reason to say no. And I remember sleeping in the car during that tournament. And luckily I had a buddy let me take a shower in his hotel, which was nice. Great shower. I still remember that was one of the best showers I've ever taken. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I've slept in the car plenty and it's, it's, it is what it is. I mean, I would say this, there's a lot of people that don't have a car to sleep in. So yeah. And at least you get to do something you love while you're doing I it. I loved it. I wasn't, I, and I can remember too, like when I think back on it, I didn't care. Like I talking about it now, I was never like, oh, I'm in the car. Like this is brutal. No, huh. I, I didn't care. I, I did not care at all. It never for one second entered my head like, oh, this is, you know, sleep in the car. But it was funny because the radio station people got wind that I was in the car and the station manager came up to me He's the guy that hired me, and he, and he knew I was a little off from the get go. You know? <laughs> but he goes, uh, he always, they always, anybody that meets me, and I'm, I'm, I own every bit of it. I'm, I'm not wired, yeah. you know, I'm not wired 100% normal. Nobody is. But I remember him kind of smiling at me, and he's like, "Next time, you know, we'll get you a hotel room." <laughs> you know, so that was Greg Bell, another, uh, another big influence. gave me, it gave me an opportunity. You remember all those guys? I mean, some people, you know. Like Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback of the Packers. You know, Aaron Rodgers, one of those guys, it's like anybody says anything bad about him, he remembers it. Yeah. Like, you know, and I'm kind of opposite that way. I remember anybody that's helped me. Anybody that's helped me, given me some support, I remember them all. I really do. It's awesome. To, I mean, it's clear you do because, you know, relationships are, it's kind of like the, uh, it's the currency of the world. And, you know, the better you are at cultivating trust and relationships, the more satisfying your life is going to be, in my opinion. So you've obviously- That's a great line. You just said relationships are the currency of the world. That's right. I think so. Is that a, is that a Ryan Warner original? That, that came up right here on this podcast. I'm feeling so inspired right now. Wow. We just came up that, with something. That is one of the best phrases I've heard in a long, <laughs> long time relationships are the currency of the world that is that might, well said and spot on that might be That's the awesome. subject of this podcast and that, that i'm giving you 50 percent of it because it's coming hey. out now i'm feeling good about it <laughs> how did you start doing like big time professional broadcasting because i know you went from that station up um and when i say that i mean like big 10 network the stuff we see you sure. on now so you were doing uh you were working at the radio station and that's where you got the Shane Sparks name, which is so cool. You, st you, you do BadgerStateWrestling.com. Yep. And then like, so how did you go from all of that kind of like local stuff to where you're at now? So the biggest break I got, and it's so much timing as well, is I was doing PA for the Wisconsin Badgers. So I'm doing that. And at that time, and this is probably like 2010, I was maybe doing it maybe 2008, 2009, couple seasons. Mm -hmm. What happened was 
is I remember doing the Big Ten Championships for UWBadgers.com. It was at Northwestern. Mm-hmm. I believe it was David Taylor's freshman year because I think he beat St. John. That's what I remember. Okay. And I remember I'm a big, like, I, I really like to visualize things. Yeah. And I remember being there and I'm watching the mat. And on the mat was Tim Johnson, Jim Gibbons, and Lee Kemp. Mm-hmm. And I'm just watching them and I'm like, that's where I want to be. It's very similar to when I'm at that Wisconsin State tournament years before. I'm in my car, I'm, in, I'm, I'm doing these reports, which is great, but I'm watching the TV guys there going, I got to get there. And now I've done that for a handful of years. Mm-hmm. But I will add this very quickly. And I take a lot of pride in this and I think it's so important. I've never gotten any place that I recall by stepping over somebody, stabbing somebody in the back. Like, Mm -hmm. again, you know why, Ryan? Because relationships are the currency. I mean, case in point, exactly. But uh, I like to visualize things. So I remember watching them and thinking, okay, this is is where I want to be. You know, Jim Gibbons has forgotten more about wrestling than I'll ever know. And I was always like, man, I wish I could, you know, do a broadcast with Jim. Uh, cause I normally, you know, do play by play. Jim's an analyst. Uh, so, so you see them there. Like, do you talk to him there or like you, leave I, I, that do, event? Not. I okay. do not, I admit, I, I introduced myself to Tim Johnson at a cyclone Hawkeye duel in like Oh seven, maybe, yeah. you know, and Tim was super, you know, he's just such a gentleman and a pros pro. I love Tim Johnson. Uh, and he was super nice to me, which again, mattered to me. Like he was very nice. Uh, so I had gotten to do. At the, at the national championships that same year when I was doing UWBadgers.com, I was going to do the selection show where mm-hmm. I was just giving the names of the field. That was a timing deal. Fell into that. Then I'm, then I'm doing that live sports radio deal in Philadelphia. And I felt, I felt pretty good about it. Normally, you know, most broadcasts, I'm like, you got to do this better. You got to do this better. I mean, very rarely do I feel good about it. Yeah. But on that particular night, I felt pretty good about it. And I did the final with Brian Hazard, who now does the PA with Jason Bryant at the mm-hmm. national tournament. And I get back to my hotel in Philadelphia. I was staying with Barry Davis. I could give you Barry Davis stories for three hours, <laughs> but I'm staying with Barry Davis. He was generous enough to let me stay in his hotel room. I didn't have to pay for it. And that was the year the Badgers took fourth. Mm. Uh, they had a rough semifinal round. I, did, went in, I remember going into the hotel and Barry was in there and I was like, oh man, what do I say? But uh, it gets over with and I go back to my hotel and Jim Gibbons is in the lobby. And I I remember thinking, okay, we're going to go up and put our bag upstairs. We're going to come down here and you got to meet Jim Gibbons. And I remember telling myself, Shane, calm down. Calm down. Be calm. Mm -hmm. And I remember going up to Jim, introduce myself. You know, we're talking for a little bit. And then Quentin Wright walks past. And Quentin Wright, I believe that was his first title. Him and I get to talking for a little bit. And while we're doing that, the Scove brothers, one wrestled, I think, at Oklahoma State, Ohio State, they're talking to Jim. And I can hear them saying, hey, we heard this guy tonight, Jim. You got to find this guy, blah, 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 blah. And Jim turns around and goes, Shane, come here. Jim goes, Shane was on this thing tonight. Talk. I'm like, well, what do you want me to say? That's him. That's him. That's him. Next thing you know, Jim asks me if I want to go out to get something to eat. Jim, myself, and Randy Lewis, of all people, get into a cab and go to a place. I think it was called Pinky's Diner. We were there for a few hours talking wrestling. There was just, again, timing. The timing, there was an opportunity. I slid in, and the rest is history. But, yeah, that was a... I mean, that stuff, and that's why I would say this to Ryan, my faith's important to me. If you said to me, there's not a God, like there's no God, it's proven. There's no God, like there is no God. Put the gun to my head and I'm going to look at you and go, yeah, there is. Pull the trigger. And you know what's going <laughs> to happen? It's going to go click. I'm right. Yeah. These stories, I don't have one of these stories. I got 50 of them. The way... God's blessed me and the opportunities he's given me are, they make the hair on my arm stand up. So I, it's, there's, 
it's pretty awesome to see. And like, when you put the energy out there in the world that you do, uh, it's going to come back to you. I'm a firm believer in that. And it's like, you don't want to get too woo woo with like uh, karma and all that, but I, I swear there's something to that. And, um, but part of it also comes down to just seizing the moment and being not afraid to talk to someone like, like you were there. Um, we're going to wind down, but I got to know just some tactical questions because I try doing play by play once this summer. And I realized just how difficult it is. What is your, let's say you have a big duel on like Friday at Carver. When do you start prepping and what's your prep routine for the week? Man, I'm always, and I'm going to adjust it heading into this upcoming season. I'm going to get, I'm going to get far more sophisticated. Uh, but to answer your question, it, it sounds kind of, I'm always preparing. Like it's, it's, it, it never stops. I mean, I'm always writing notes. Uh, you know, I was listening to a baseball game the other day and a guy made a call where he said, you know, makes the play at the cut of the grass over to first base. I mean, I was like, cut of the grass. I'd never heard that before. I went and wrote it down. Yeah. All my good stuff is stolen. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Like it's all stolen. Okay. But uh, I really start to, if I got a duel on like a Friday night, uh, I'm, I'm really paying attention beginning on Monday, lining up some coaches conference calls, getting the media notes from the SIDs who do a phenomenal job, you know, so it's, it's all week, you know, okay. I mean, like anything else, don't procrastinate, you know, try to, you know, get a little bit of work done every night, <clears throat> you know, Google some stories, try to find, that's one thing I'm really trying to get better at is storytelling. It's difficult you know, with wrestling, just the cadence of it, having a play-by-play -play and an analyst, there's not a necessarily a ton of time for storytelling uh, in comparison to a sport like baseball. Mm -hmm. But I think the stories, that's what I love about your podcast and these podcasts is you get to hear some of these stories with guys. Yeah. Uh, but it's, um, I'm always tweaking it, you know, always tweaking it, always looking, you know, to get better. It's like anything else. You got to just keep, you know, finding new little tricks and, and ways to uh, get better. I love how when you, even if you're listening to another sport, you're listening to the broadcaster and picking that up. So you're, you're, you're kind of always, always learning. Um, one thing I also noticed, looks like you're a big biker. Do you cycle a lot? I, I do. I, I do. I love it. I mean, I wish I would have found it 20 years ago. So I, uh, this, this summer I'm going to, uh, the goal anyways, is to do a, a one day, 225 mile ride. That's the goal this year. Last year I did, uh, uh, a 12 hour was on the bike for 11 because it was at night. You got to change lights and water bottles, go to the bathroom and all that stuff. But I was on for 11 hours. I think I did about 175 miles. Okay. That was a push, but I tried to, uh, I mean, a couple of days ago, I did a, you know, 35 mile ride in the summertime. I try to ride at least five days a week and it's, I love it. It gives me something to, you know, something to shoot for. So a couple of big rides later on this summer. And uh, again, trying to, unlike what I did a long time ago, enjoy the process. Yeah. <laughs> enjoy the process. Do you ever uh, find yourself like vis visualizing or drifting off into thought about like a, a broadcast that you've done in the past or that you're going to do in the future? All the time. All yeah. the time. Yeah. Because people will say to me like, oh man, you got, you know, you're so excited. And I, and my quick response to that is you'd be excited too. Like, yeah. Yes, going to Carver Hawkeye or, you know, Schottenstein Center or Rec Hall or Bryce Jordan Center or any arena. Like, it's exciting. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's not like it's like crazy that I'm excited about this stuff. This stuff, the Big Ten Network is the major leagues. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a great network. The people are unbelievable. They're professional. And once you go to the major leagues, you don't ever want to go back to the minor. <laughs> that's another thing I've learned. Once you play in the big leagues, you don't want to go back to the minors. It reminds me, it's one of my favorite scenes, Kevin Costner and Bull Durham, when he talks about the major leagues. And that is so <laughs> true. You know, it's just, it's awesome. It's, it's, it's been such a great ride. And are you also a sales rep during the day for track? So I am. So now with, with track, uh, getting, you know, purchased by flow. Uh, but, uh, you know, so that's, that's been great. And, and they know this, this is nothing that's going to surprise anybody, but I'm still, you know, I still broadcasting is my passion and yeah. I want to do more broadcasting. I'm, I'm grateful for the, the sales job I have. It's a good, good living, 
but I want to do more broadcasting and I wouldn't, uh, I'm 45 years old now. So it's, it's, I can't think exactly the way that I did when I was 25, but if anybody's nuts enough to do, do something, it's me. And that yeah. I've always been a big believer in, and again, you got to, it's not this simple, but you throw all the chips in the middle and you bet on yourself. I do not want to be 80 years old wondering what if. I'm okay if things don't work out. I mean, mm -hmm. things have worked out up to this point far, you know, far better than I could have ever imagined, really. So I've been very thankful to, to have gotten the opportunities I have. But I got, I got more I want to do. And uh, I'm not going to wonder what if. It's not no. happening. You know, so I... I could see myself throwing some more chips in oh, and, and trying something else. I hope so, man. I, I'm with you though. Like I do sales during the day. It's a, it's a good living and it's, it's pretty, uh, it's good for people who are kind of independent and don't want to be managed all the time. But yeah, I mean, if I could do audio documentaries in this all day, I'd be a happy man. And, and I do spend most of my time doing it. So generally I am pretty happy. Um, last question for you. I've heard you say this before, uh, as a parent and to your kids, you say, uh, advice is be kind, be normal. I'm a little surprised by the be normal because you seem like someone who's living out of the normal life. Why is that your advice to your kids? Man, that is a really interesting question. I got to handle this one with kid gloves. So here's what I would say, man, that's you put me on the spot. I didn't expect this question. Because you're not a no living a normal life. Moving to Arizona is not normal. Is normal, not I, normal. I think what I, what I mean by that is, you know, based on some experiences I've had where maybe people haven't always been the best to me yeah. at times, be kind, be normal. Like, don't be causing scenes. Like, you know, that's kind of what I mean by that. I mean, yeah. when I say be normal, it's more about how you treat people, not necessarily how you live. Yeah. To me, it all goes back to how you treat people. It's the most important thing there is. And I think you can oversimplify it, And that's what I try to do. Yep. Be kind, be normal. If you can do those things, I think you'll be all right. Yep. Yeah. And like the kindness kind of overarches all of it, but yeah, I think just from listening to you say that to other people, it's like, have some humility about yourself. Absolutely. You know? Because I would say this, Ryan, this, if I didn't do any more broadcasting, the show, I promise you will go on. The show will go on. Um, there's other people I could do this job. I'm not arrogant enough to think like nobody else can do this as good as I can. It's not true. There's, there's people I could do this, enjoy every minute of it. Don't, cause it could all be gone tomorrow. In, in, in a lot of ways it's, it's life, right? I mean, in a lot of ways it's life. I, you know, somebody dies, unfortunately. Hey, we all grieve. You take a couple of days, but you, you can't take forever. Show's going to go on. Like people move on. It's, it, it's maybe a weird analogy, but it's, I get it's, it. It's accurate. Like yeah. things go on and Hey, I'd like to think that if I didn't do this, my name would come up in conversation from time to time. Like, oh man, remember when Sparks did this? Oh man, we missed this. But at the end of the day, people tune in to Big Ten Network Wrestling to watch the best wrestlers in the country. That's what they show up there for. And from my standpoint, if I can add some value, that's great. But I also understand I, I'm not the show. Let the wrestling be the show and I guide it along. That's my job. Well, you guide it masterfully, and we love tuning in and watching you. And it's been awesome to have you on the show. Shane Sparks, thank you for your time, my brother. I hope this is uh, this is actually the first time we've talked before, which is crazy. Um, hopefully, first of many. You have a great day, my friend. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. Great questions. Really enjoyed myself. Thank you, and keep up the great work, Ryan.